In this episode of Falmouth in Focus, we'll celebrate with Brenda Swain as she receives the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year Award, visit the Cahoon Museum of American Art for a showcase of paintings by artist Brenda Kingery, and gather with supporters of the Falmouth Education Foundation to get a glimpse of some of FEF's most recently supported projects. All this and much more on this episode of Falmouth in Focus. Hello and welcome to Falmouth in Focus, FCTV's current affairs program. I'm your host, Michael Kasparian. During a recent weekly video briefing, Falmouth Health Agent Scott McGann reported that the case count for COVID-19 positive tests has increased slightly from the previous week in Falmouth. With the continued virus transmission throughout the Cape and the Commonwealth, residents are encouraged to get vaccinated obtain the booster shots when you are eligible, and follow the local masking guidelines. You can view Scott McGann's weekly video briefings on FCTV Government Channel 15, our Facebook page, and fctv.org. The Falmouth Chamber Citizen of the Year Award honors an outstanding individual who has made significant contributions to our community. Postponed one year because of COVID, friends, family, and Falmouth community leaders came together on October 7th to honor Brenda Swain as the 2020 award recipient. Although she's best known for her work in building the Falmouth Service Center into the premier community-focused organization that it is today, it was Brenda's additional work in the community that made her the standout candidate for this award. Well, we're just thrilled after two postponements in 18 months that we're finally able to pay tribute to our Citizen of the Year, Brenda Swain, in this amazing venue here, the Seacrest, as you can see. We have uh, a great sunset in back of us, perfect day for her. And who could be more deserving? Nobody could be more deserving than Brenda. There was a time in my life where I needed some help and I knew who to call. And I called Brenda Swain and she kindly and compassionately led me to the services that helped change my life. There are thousands of stories in our community just like that about people that Brenda very quietly, compassionately, and lovingly helped. And it is so wonderful to be able to honor her in person here tonight at the Seacrest. So Brenda, Falmouth loves you right back, and we're so grateful to pay tribute to you tonight. We have 650 volunteers today, a number of staff, and her compassion and her uh, thoughtfulness uh, made the service center what it is uh, today and we couldn't be happier to be honoring her and we thank the chamber for helping that. As you know tonight we celebrate an outstanding citizen who over time has exemplified the very attributes we seek to honor. A person well known for, to many for her professional accomplishments and widespread contributions to the betterment of society. She is a model citizen admired and esteemed for successfully balancing her devotion to family with years of professional integrity and tireless civic participation, helping people along the way, in many cases, quietly and without fanfare or recognition. Please welcome to the lectern our Outstanding Citizen of the Year, Brenda Swain. If you know me, I'm always trying to look at the world as the glass is half full and to focus on what is right in life and to do this by taking actions in support of people around you, erring on the side of generosity. Those kinds of actions make you a better person and make the community a better person, a better place to be. I encourage you to be the best you can be and shine that little light of yours because it will make you feel better and it will just brighten our community even more. And find the work in the world that makes you feel like you've never had to work a day in your life. I was blessed, that's how my work always was. 
Thank you for joining me here tonight. COVID kept us apart for a year and a half. The hung huggers among us have had a very challenging time. Please be safe, be love and give love, and appreciate each and every day. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be here with so many amazing community members and family members and friends to celebrate this great community of Falmouth. And I'm honored to be the citizen of the year, but it's really all about everybody in this room. That's what makes this town special. Congratulations again, Brenda, and thanks to Andrew Richards for covering that event. It's time now for three things from Town Hall, SCTV's condensed version of the takeaways from recent municipal meetings. Selections are chosen based on community impact. The Falmouth Planning Board met last week and on their agenda was a discussion about the recodification of the Falmouth Zoning Bylaw, which will be presented to town meeting in November. Charlotte Harris of the Planning Board gave a thorough explanation of what will be presented to the public attending the meeting. This is a reorganization and we've been calling it old wine in a new bottle. It's really not a change, chapter uh, 240. It's the same information, it's the same rules, it's the same bylaws, but they've been reorganized. And first we're going to look at the table of contents, if you haven't seen them. Those of you who are here to comment, have you actually seen the new bylaws? You've looked at them online? They're on the town website. Um, you put in the search, uh, recodification, chapter 240, and you'll go right to it, and you'll be able to look at them. But this is, Jed, is there any way to, to make the printing bigger? Sure. Rather than being the old organization that was very scattered because it had been added to over time, things were, uh, weren't together. If you wanted to look up what do I need in order to build a house in Falmouth, you would have to know to look in several different parts of that 255-page document. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the Falmouth Police Department. Recently, the police department held a celebration event in the back of the building where the public was invited to come and meet the officers and interact with police vehicles and equipment. Several dignitaries joined in the celebration and recognition of the landmark occasion. As we walk around, this is an extraordinary community in Falmouth, uh, one of the most sought after places to live. And as we go around and look at the beautiful green where people can uh, join together, and things they feel strongly about. If you go through all the small businesses, and you know, uh, and they know, uh, that they're secure in conducting business in this area. Uh, at times of crisis, whether it's an emergency uh, in their homes, uh, whatever the case may be, they know that the Falmouth Police will be there. We couldn't have the kind of community we have, enjoying the freedoms, uh, lessening the worries about our own security, our family security, without the police. The town's planning department is leading a working group to discuss the Davis Strait section of Route 28 in Falmouth. The group is moving in stages and plans to collect information and opinions from a variety of sources in town, including the public. That, that survey, as well as a public website, uh, which is up today, hopefully you've all had a chance to review that website. Um, <clears throat> but based on the information that we received from uh, the survey, got a sense of what the community was generally comfortable with, or at least I shouldn't say the community, there are 75 respondents, so not, not really enough of a response to say that uh, this is uh, what the whole community feels, um, but there are representative sampling. Um, and so we started uh, to take that information and to frame it out into zoning to see uh, where we got. And as we started doing that, um, we kept finding these little snags like we like this idea in theory but when it actually plays out uh there were problems seeing it through to the end and, and getting to what we think is uh uh the, the vision that you have as a community for this corridor to see the meetings in their entirety check out government channel 15's program schedule at fctv.org we're going to take a quick break and when we return the community health center of cape cod will help us to raise awareness about the prevention of breast cancer. Stay with us.
we have an unusual request. Close your eyes and try to imagine being outside for days last winter without a wallet or a working phone. You're a bone chilling cold. You wonder where you will wash. Is a toilet or get your next meal? How will you get to work? Address your health issues or fill out an online application. You have just envisioned the life of someone experiencing homelessness in Falmouth. It is a lonely and often a hopeless place to be. Belonging to each other just finished its sixth season, providing cold weather housing and supportive services to Falmouth individuals. We welcomed 18 men and women to our residential program. They felt safe in the midst of a pandemic. We provided simple things, a house with heat, a bed, a place to shower, a working phone and computer, and someone to guide them to stable housing. Over six seasons, we housed 157 people. Roughly 85% went to stable housing by the end of each season. All this was possible because of the generosity and loving kindness of the Falmouth community and our volunteers. It's amazing to see people evolve. They gradually move from beat up and defeated to encouraged, hopeful, and grateful. These are some of their own words. I originally was just happy to have a safe place, but it was a lot more than that. With a lot of help from my caseworker, I was able to save money and start to rebuild my credit, which is something I struggled with. I now can see the light at the end of the tunnel. This program allows me to have a fresh start away from an abusive relationship. The volunteers are wonderful. I'm grateful for stable housing so that I can get a job. The computer allows me to do my classes, and my Zoom counseling. It just feels nice to feel like a regular person again. So now our thoughts turn to our seventh season. Success depends on the housing we rent, the volunteers who commit, and available funding. If you're interested in knowing more about us, contact us as shown on your screen. So thank you, Thelma, for all you did for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Truly, we do belong to each other. Welcome back. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and statistics show that one in eight women will get some form of breast cancer in their lives. We talk with Dr. Lila Blake of the Community Health Center of Cape Cod, who discusses the importance of early detection, treatment, and to raise awareness to cut those numbers down. It's important to have a month like this for a can cancer that's as prevalent as breast cancer is. It's the number one most uh, prevalent cancer in women, aside from certain types of skin cancers. So we want to constantly be raising awareness, maintaining uh, communication with people in the community about, you know, how do I screen? What should I know about the warning signs of breast cancer? What are my risk factors? Who do I talk to if I find something um, before it's time for me to get screened? Um, and in, in addition to that, because of the pandemic, a lot of people didn't see the, the walks and all of the um, communications that take place every year around Breast Cancer Awareness Month and in other times of the year because people couldn't get together. Uh, also, people were concerned about going in and getting screened. And that's one of the things I'm most concerned about right now is that people have put off their screenings because, um, you know, initially in the beginning parts of the pandemic, people weren't, they weren't having non-essential or elective medical procedures being done in hospitals and in imaging centers. So people weren't being called in to do them, but even now that things are opening back up again, people are still some, you know, a little bit worried about, am I safe going into an imaging center to get a mammogram or an ultrasound or what have you. It's really important that women and men, to be honest, are aware of the, the screening um, guidelines and also what the early warning signs might be. 
um, people will oftentimes um, not feel anything or they'll feel something that's there and it ends up being benign. And there's a lot of questions about, should I bring this to the attention of my, of my doctor or my provider? The reason it's important to bring any concerns like that to your doctor is because breast cancer is um, like many cancers, pretty treatable, you know, highly effective treatments are available um, for people at the early stages of uh, breast cancer. And so we always tell people don't feel like it's a dumb question to bring this to the attention of your provider. We want to know if you feel something that that wasn't there before, or that just doesn't feel right to you. Um, There's some, I think, mythical information out there about breast cancer doesn't hurt, but you can have a a tumor that is, is tender to the touch and painful. So just because you have, if you feel something there and it, and it does hurt, that doesn't mean that it can't be breast cancer. So anything that's out of the ordinary, please um, ask ask your provider to examine you and to send you for some imaging if that's what's required. Dr. Blake says most women with an average risk should schedule yearly mammograms starting at age 40, unless there is a family history. Talk to your provider for the best plan of action. Thanks to Bob Fenstermaker for that piece. A new exhibit that launched this month at the Cahoon Museum of American Art is a showcase of paintings by artist Brenda Kingery. Through this exhibition entitled Weaving Messages, visitors are encouraged to slow down, look, and see the world in Kingery's canvas. So we have a very full and exciting fall and winter season at the Cahoon Museum. We're featuring two exhibitions. One is called Brenda Kingery Weaving Messages, and it features the art of Chickasaw artist Brenda Kingery. The second exhibition is called Interwoven Contemporary Basketry, and it features new innovative work by regional New England basket artists. And these are artists who are really taking the art form of basketry and innovating and doing new things with the medium. Well, every artist has their series. And uh, a a great deal of my series started, I was in graduate school in Japan, in Okinawa. So I had art that, I studied art there. But when I came back to Oklahoma, powwows, I was very inspired by the Native American powwows at Red Earth. Well, it's kind of unusual in that it's narrative symbolism. And Native Americans tell stories. And my paintings look abstract, but actually each of these paintings have their own stories. And one of the first people was my grandfather, and he was a cowboy during Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And so this particular painting behind me is the story of him going over on his horse on Blue Mountain. The last piece is on Tupelo, Mississippi, and that is the homeland for the Chickasaws, and my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather from 1730 lived in Tupelo, and as an artist, we went to study there. Yes, I want you to come and see it and read the stories and find out that we're, Chickasaws are very much alive and we have a lot to offer and we have stories to tell. The best place to check is our website, our events page, and you can see all that's going on. Again, we do have on-site, family-friendly events. We have free open houses, talks, lectures, in-person and virtual. So that's the best place, uh, cahoonmuseum.org, to check it all out. The exhibition runs through December 19th. Thanks to FCTV intern Marcus Greco for that story. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's autonomous underwater vehicle, Orpheus, is a new class of underwater technology designed to unlock the mysteries of the ocean down to the depths of over 30,000 feet. Orpheus is capable of operating in any part of the ocean without human intervention to complete complex missions of discovery, as we'll see in this HUI video.
Thanks to Hui for submitting that amazing video segment. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll get some fall fishing tips from Ryan Collins of My Fishing Cape Cod. Stay with us. Welcome back to Falmouth in Focus. This month, Ryan Collins of My Fishing Cape Cod takes our views to fish for summer flounders, and along the way, gives us some tips for fall fishing. Good morning, Ryan here from My Fishing Cape Cod. Absolutely spectacular early October morning here on the Cape. I've got a bucket full of mummy chugs, and hopefully today, if we're lucky, Lauren and I will get into some big keeper-sized fluke. Summer flounder are also called fluke. They are ferocious hunters which like to lay on the bottom and ambush different types of bait fish. For this trip, I'd be using live killifish for bait. I caught the killifish by using a minnow trap baited with bread and set in an estuary during low tide. All right, so we've arrived at spot number one and we have lots of peanut bunker schools all around the boat right now. So I'm hoping that the fluke are going to be hanging out beneath the peanut bunker schools. So today I'm using a size one circle hook and I'm going to hook the killifish right through the lips. And I have a small little weight, that might be a quarter of an ounce. I could probably use even less. And I'm just going to drop this guy down to the bottom Once he hits bottom, I'm gonna reel it up just maybe one, two feet. And we're using circle hooks. So if I feel a bite from a fluke, I'm just gonna let him take it and then just start reeling and hopefully we'll get a good hook set. The killifish was swimming nicely just off the bottom as we drifted in the current. Lauren wasn't quite sure what to expect as she waited for a bite. Watch closely as a nice fluke zones in on the bait. Oh, wait. He's still playing with it. Unless it's a very lively bait. <laughs> okay, I think he's stuck. Oh, oh, okay. I, I think I've got, I've got one. Okay. Oh, it is one. I see him. Oh, <gasps> there he is. Whoa. Wow, they're freaky looking. The fluke season runs from May 23rd until October 9th, and the minimum size is 17 inches. Lauren's fluke measured 16 inches, so we let the fish go. Nevertheless, it was a beautiful October morning. Autumn is a beautiful time to be on Cape. The scenery is changing, and if the weather allows, the fishing can be great. In today's episode, we touched upon just a fraction of the fishing opportunities that are available during the fall. And I'm looking forward to sharing another adventure with you in next weekend's show. Thanks to Ryan Collins of My Fishing Cape Cod for that report. 
Supporters of the Falmouth Education Foundation gathered at the Kunameset Inn on October 5th for a showcase of the special projects that they have funded in the schools this year. And FCTV was there for the celebration. So the Falmouth Education Foundation is a nonprofit here in the town of Falmouth that was organized in 2004 to support the teachers and the students in the Falmouth Public Schools. Regardless of what the grant is, if it's a mini grant or a teacher opportunity fund or a larger FEF grant, students are being exposed to and being a part of something that wouldn't normally happen throughout the school day. And I think whatever it is, it also gets other teachers excited and opens their eyes to new opportunities and how can we use this amazing funding that FEF is able to provide. Uh, going into this year, there'll be about 35 different grants um, in all the schools that actually impact literally all the students. Um, this year, we've given away about $100,000. Uh, we passed the uh, marker of $1 million given away back in 2019. So this is a process that we go through every year um, in support of the teachers and the students in the Falmouth Public Schools. Uh, it opens the doors for students to have new experiences and to get others excited about what possibilities there are out there. So I would just like to say thank you to FEF, Falmouth Education Foundation, for all of the grants that they've given us over the years. They've been very, very generous. Uh, we've had at least five, maybe six grants that have supported our Vernal Pools project. Created two Vernal Pools at the high, high school and the Lawrence School, the pollinator gardens adjacent to the pools, um, artwork projects, engineering projects, picnic tables, benches, um, citizen science programs, uh, film festival, pollinator party with entomologists visiting the classroom. I can't even remember all the things they funded because this project has really taken on a life of its own and it's grown tremendously over the years and that's all because of FEF support. Uh, we'd love for people to be involved. If you'd like to be involved, um, please go to the Falmouth Education website um, and you can learn about how to contact us. Um, we're always looking for volunteers, uh, board members, um, and contributors. So thank you very much for your support. The Falmouth Education Foundation has supported innovation and excellence in the Falmouth Public Schools since 2006 funding over 800 teacher-created projects. Thanks to Ryan Weber for that report. FCTV wants to remind you that television can be as easy as hitting record on your smartphone. We'd like to invite all Falmouth residents and visitors to share their slice of life with us. Email us your photos and videos, or upload them to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram using the hashtag MyFalmouth or Falmouth in Focus to be featured on the show. Thank you to our most recent contributors. We leave you now with the sights and sounds from T-Ticket Elementary School's annual Walk to School Day. Thank you for watching Falmouth in Focus. We'll see you next time.